Thanks for listening to the Lunch and Learn with Dr. Barry, here to help educate, motivate, and put you on the right path to take control of your health through weekly discussions on topics in the medical field, public health arena, and in your community. And now your host, Dr. Barry. And welcome to another episode of the Lunch and Learn with Dr. Barry. I'm your host, Dr. Barry Pierre, your favorite board certified internist, founder of drbarrypierre.com, as well as the CEO of Pierre Medical Consulting, helping you empower yourself for better health with the number one podcast for patient advocacy. This week, we have an amazing guest, Dr. Philippe Dion, who is a board certified neurologist. He's actually the first neurologist that we've had on the show, and he definitely set the bar because we got to talk a lot about the brain and nutrition and just overall health, right? Which, you know, when you think about it, you don't really put too much onus on it, right? But like after this episode, you are really going to say like, you know what? Let me make sure I'm taking care of my brain because I only have one, right? And that's something that we really drove home during the episode. The fact that we only got one brain is probably... If you ask me, the most important organ of the body. But if we don't take care of it, right, if we do things that, you know, in our teens, in our 20s, in our 30s, that does not help it, right, then we're going to see problems when we get 40, 50, 60, right? It's, it's not going to be a surprise uh, when we run into these medical related problems associated with our neurological health, right? And that's really the theme I want you guys to, you know, get from here, right? Again, we talk about health a lot. We talk about diabetes, cholesterol, blood. We talk about, you know, not smoking. We talk about all these different things here. But understand that neurologic health is extremely important, right? And that's why I love this episode because, you know, Dr. Dion, who, you know, has already wrote a book, you know, he has his own wellness institute that incorporates his neurological practice. And he even has his own app in the app store or, you know, Google Play, whatever that the Android store is, right? He, he has his own app there as well. You're going to get to hear a very well-rounded individual who is a physician who really wants to put their patient care at the forefront, especially when it comes to neurological health. So again, like always, right, you know, if you have not had a chance, go ahead and subscribe to that podcast. You know, let me know what you think about this episode. Shoot, shoot me a five-star review if you must, right? And, you know, tell a friend, tell a friend, right? That's really the goal of every week, right? Just tell one person, right? Yeah, you don't even have to tell 50 people. Just tell one person, and then that's good for me. So you guys, get ready for another amazing episode with Dr. Duyo. One of the sponsors for the Lunch and Learn Community Podcast is the Lunch and Learn Community Store, where you can find t-shirts, sweatshirts, coffee mugs, stickers, and wristbands with the motto, Empower Yourself for Better Health. Remember, 50% of all proceeds will go to the Five Star Scholarship Foundation, where we give out college scholarships to deserving high school seniors across the country. Thus far, we have given out over 20 deserving scholarships to students across the country. So again, 50% of the proceeds will be uh, blessed to the Five Star Scholarship Foundation. And today you can get the coupon code LUNCH20 and you can get 20% off your purchase and you support these high school students across the country. Again, the Lunch and Learn Community Store is at shop.drbarrypierre.com and the coupon code is LUNCH20. All right, let's learn, listeners. You just heard another amazing introduction from a guest. I'm very interested for you guys to hear because it's something different. We actually haven't had someone not only from his field, from a specialty, uh, to kind of talk to you about like health in general, right? So I'm definitely excited. Again, Dr. Dion, thank you for joining today with the Lunch and Learn community. Well, thank you for having me. This is exciting to be on your, your podcast, and I'm looking forward to this conversation. So I gave him, you know, I gave him your bio, right? First of all, amazing bio, right? But if someone, because I got some lunch learner listeners who like to like skip the intro, I don't know why they do it. They like to skip the intro and get right into the meat and potatoes uh, of a show. For someone who skipped the bio, right? But maybe they read it, but they kind of glossed over it. What is something that isn't in the bio that someone may not know about you, but you would feel like, you know what? If they walk away from this episode, at least I hope they know this. Yeah, I, I think it's probably that. I would say that my my goal is to really get people to reach their full potential, especially their full neurological potential. I feel like that we have so many limitations that we put on ourselves and that we put on our patients in medicine. And I'm just really trying to empower people to kind of live their best life and to get as healthy as possible. And you know what I love about it is because I've, I've had, you know, quite a few guests on the show, but I've never had one who really stressed the importance of the neurological potential, right? So I, I'm like very excited to kind of get into that aspect, especially when it comes to, you know, healthcare and, you know, how that helps overall well-being, right? So I'm definitely excited to get into that. So what made you, right, become, again, I always add, and I 
especially I'm an internist, right? So what what was what about neurology? Say, you know what? This is the, the field for me. Like, what was it? Uh, so it's a, it's a couple of things. I think my first experience with neurological disorders was that I had a cousin growing up who had epilepsy. I had a grandmother who developed Alzheimer's. So I got to see the impact that neurological disorders have on on people's lives and their families. And as devastating as it was to see. Neurological disorders have a different impact than other diseases, right? I mean, they, they impact who you are at every level, the way that you think, your strength, your ability to function throughout your life. And so I always found that fascinating. But I also grew up, I was born and raised Catholic. And you know, I probably don't practice as much Catholicism as I probably should, according to my parents. But, um, but uh, you know, you're, you're, you're taught that you are created in the image of God. And I think for us, the parts of us that are most God-like are our spirits and our brains. Our brains are capable of creating, creating our external environment, our internal environment, um, creating our lives. So, and, and, you know, obviously some of the, the history that, you know, they may not know is uh, you've been kind of well in tune with the medical system in and of itself, right? It isn't as if you uh, became a physician and that's when you kind of get enamored with it, right? You are on the other side as a patient. And uh, l- let's talk a little bit about that, right? And then really kind of lead into like, you know, like how that's kind of played out in your career thus far. I think people, when they first see me, they're like, oh, doctor, neurologist, epilepsy specialist, author, creator of of this app. Um, But what they don't know is that I've been a lifelong patient. I've been a patient since I was 18 years old. So my entire adult life, I'm now 40, so more than half my life. Um, So I've gotten to see things from that perspective. And um, being a patient, I think has made me a significantly better doctor. When I was 18, freshman in college, a couple of weeks into my college career, and I went to college on a, on a tennis scholarship. And so um, to play for the team, that you have to undergo a physical. And so when I underwent that physical, they found something wrong in my urine. Um, initially, they didn't clear me to play on the team, um, but they did a couple of weeks later. And we go on our first uh, trip to go play a tournament out of state. And during that trip, I'm, I'm playing my match, and my entire body goes into one large cramp, and I just cannot move. I collect down and I can't move any muscle. And I ended up having to be rushed to the hospital. And uh, probably about a month after that is when I was diagnosed with kidney failure. At the age of 28, um, eight days after walking across the stage at Carnegie Hall to get my medical degree, to get my diploma, I walked into the halls um, of Columbia Presbyterian Hospital here in New York um, to have a kidney transplant. And so I have been a lifelong patient. And that, like I said, has made me a better doctor. It's influenced the way that I practice medicine. Um, it allows me to relate to my patients much better because I understand what they want. I know what it feels like to, to have to face your mortality. I know what it feels like to have to take medications that don't make you so great. I know what it feels like to look in the mirror and not recognize yourself in it. And I, I, the reason why I love about that is that I think uh, a, a lot of physicians, especially the, the ones who haven't been in a position where they've had to be on the patient side, right? Um, I, I think it does lose a lot, right? Like I, I think there's, there's a, even they could be as empathetic as they want because they really haven't been there, right? Sometimes it is difficult for them to make that extra leap, go that extra mile uh, for their patient because they just, they've never experienced it. So I, I, was, I was definitely interested because because I know something like that, right, is is going to help shape the career, right? I know something like that is going to help shape your want for your patient. And especially when you talk about, you know, making sure you improve that neurological health, uh, which is something I think a lot of people downplay, unfortunately, right? Because I, I, because one, it's not something that you you physically can touch, right? It's not sexy, right? It's not something that, you know, gets a, a, an entire month, right? In a, in a different, it's not like that level of, uh, I guess, quote unquote, popularity. And because that occurs, right, I think a lot of people kind of downplay its level of importance. But like, again, I'm thankful that you're, you're on the show today, because I really want you to kind of get uh, the listeners together. So they kind of understand, right, you know, you know, how important it is to really make sure you're optimally, uh, um, you're, you're optimized from a health standpoint. Place, specifically from a neurological, which has so many devastating um, effects when you're not. What is? What are some of the things that you do that kind of helps uh, people improve from a neurological standpoint? Right? When someone says, "Like, yeah, I'm a neurologist. Um, yeah, I'm going to a neurologist." Like, what? What do they typically do? Right? So, because that that way, I, I want people to kind of be in that driver's seat when they hear, "Like, all right, this is a neurologist. Like, but what is? All right, he's a brain doctor. What does that even mean? Like, what is that?" <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> So, you know, I take care of people that have a whole host of, of brain and spinal cord issues. So they can have strokes, 
epilepsies or, or seizures, uh, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, headaches, uh, back issues. Um, and one of the things that I realized pretty early in my career, and I've, I've been in attending now for about six years, is that the biggest impact that I had on my patients wasn't in prescribing medications or taking them to the operating room for epilepsy surgery. It was really when I got them to think very differently about their health, their life, and even whatever neurological disorder was going on. That, that's where um, you truly empower people. And so I think in, ter in terms of taking care of our neurological health and really reaching our full neurological potential, there are things that we can do that we'll, we'll certainly talk about. But the first thing that we need to do is change the way that we think, change the decisions that we make on a regular I, I love it. Let's talk to him. I love the mindset. Let's go. You know, like, so every thought that you have gets wired into your brain. And the more you continue to have those same thoughts, the more hardwired it gets into your brain, right? whether those thoughts are positive or negative. And for most of us, um, we've got a default mode where we get a lot of negative thoughts throughout the day. Mm. Well, why, do, why do you think it's de defaulted that way? Is it just nurture? Is it just like, what, what do you, if you, if you had to choose yeah, one way? There's a couple of things, right? So I tell people all the time that the primary role of your brain is twofold. One, it is to keep you safe and it is to get you moving, right? So so let's let's talk about the first one, to keep you safe. So in terms of keeping you safe, it means to minimize your risk. It means to minimize your the potential that you're going to face danger. And for a lot of people, that means doing the things that they are used to doing because they know what the outcome of that thing is going to be, right? So even when you talk about um, careers, you know, People will stay miserable in a job forever because they have the security of that paycheck that comes in every couple of weeks. They have the security of whatever benefits that they get instead of really following what they are passionate about. Right. Um, and part of that is because they're trying to minimize their risk. Um, so just so, so they'll so your brain will essentially say, you know what, I don't want you to try this new thing because I'm not sure what's over there. Right. And that we see that play out all the time, right? People people take the same way home every single day from work, right? To the point that they can't even tell you how they got home. <laughs> it's like <laughs> they went to sleep while they were driving, which is potentially dangerous, you know? Um, so yeah, people do that in every aspect of their lives. They stay in relationships that you know, that are not healthy, um, because they are scared of being alone, they're scared of potentially not being able to find somebody else. So people operate from the perspective of fear often. And so it's really about changing the way that we think um, and recognizing that the best thing that you can do for your brain is actually to switch things up from time to time. I'm a big believer in that you need to reinvent yourself every five or six years. I, I was giving a talk at a conference, a neurological conference um, about two weeks ago in California. And um, one of the speakers got up and said, how he's been working on the same research for 50 years. And I thought to myself, oh my God, like you have been doing the same thing for 50 years. <laughs> like, like, you, you know, like how, how incredibly boring and unstimulating and unchallenging is that? And, and I think when people make the same decisions every day, um, they take the same actions every day. Then what I find most interesting is that then they turn around and ask, why is my life not changing? Right? They have the same thoughts, make the same decisions, take the same steps every single day. And why is my life not changing? You know, you know, I love, you know, I love about that because I think a lot of times people think that, you know, it's just kind of like a quote unquote self-conscious, but you're breaking it down to the point that, no, this is like hardwired in, like this is, this is down to the tissue saying, no, no, chemical wise, like, no, this is why you're doing the same thing over and over again. It's not, not a, a lack of willpower. No, your brain is literally saying like, nope, you're not going to go that way because we don't know where that way goes. Right. Mm. And when we, when we do new things, that's when our brain actually makes new neurons, make new, makes new nerve cells, makes new connections. That's when we truly expand on the potential that our brains have and that our lives have. And, and I love that because, of course, um, you know, I, I follow you on social media. So I, I, I know a lot of times you'll post a video where you're just in different scenes and, you know, you tell the viewers to kind of like just focus on the scene behind me. Don't even really like look at me. Just focus on what's going on back here just to kind of generate new processes going on. So I, like I said, I, I'm, I'm definitely uh, with you as far as this process is concerned. Um, now, is that something that, you know, that that's kind of kind of led your path as far as the motivation, right? And the reason why I ask, 
uh, especially for those, you know, especially my left listeners who may not, most physicians, right? We're pretty mundane. We're pretty boring, right? We pretty much kind of do the same thing, go to work. Clock, we, we're we're kind of hardwired to do that as well. But you're in a situation, especially as a neurologist, which I'm very interested in, you do a lot more different things that I doubt I would expect from a neurologist. Um, so first I want to, let's, let's talk about the, 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 the Inland Brain Fit Institute, right? Let's, I want to talk about that motivation. What was that about? Cause I'm always enamored when I see physicians kind of go a little bit of a different direction that, um, usually because their colleagues don't go, uh, they kind of get, you know, looked at as kind of weird. Like what, what was that about? So, I mean, I, I think part of it, you, you kind of hit that nail on the head, right? I mean, as doctors, even though people on the outside would say, oh, you know, their jobs are so intellectually stimulating, they're making decisions that impact people's lives, all which is very true. But I find that as doctors, we actually don't learn new things. And oftentimes, <sighs> the thinking that we do, right, there's billions of dollars that goes into research that you could deduce just by logical reasoning, right? And oftentimes they do the same research over and over. Uh, Let's learn community members. You can't see me, but I'm literally like shaking my head and like, uh-huh. Yep. Yep. You're right. Yep. You. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so we fool <laughs> ourselves into thinking that we're learning new things, even though that we're not. And we're not learning anything that's going to impact the lives of our patients today. If we're lucky, maybe it's years from now. And what I had realized was, like I said before, it was really where I had the biggest impact was about getting people to change the way that they, they think. And getting people to exercise on a regular basis, to eat right, to find ways to minimize their stress, to constantly learn. Those were the things that when I was talking to patients about, that was having the biggest impact on their lives. Because look, for most diseases out there, there are no cures, right? And we can debate why there are no cures for a long time. So we'll, we'll, we'll do that for another episode. But there, <laughs> there, are, there are no cures. But you know, you can make symptoms better with a lot of lifestyle changes. And even if you couldn't with lifestyle changes, just by changing the way that we think about whatever disorder or disease process is affecting us can have a significant impact. And I know that both personally as a patient who's had kidney disease since he's been 18, and I know that as a, as a provider, you know. So for me, when I was first diagnosed with kidney failure, when I first had a kidney transplant, that was a really difficult time. I mean, I was angry. I was frustrated. I went through the why me? I did everything right. How could this happen? Right. For a while, my identity was wrapped up in my diagnosis. And it wasn't until I started changing the way that I I thought about myself and what was going on with my body that my life started to change. And so, well, you know, I'll, I'll very openly say, yes, I've had a kidney transplant, I've got kidney disease. There are times there are bumps in the road, right? And I sort of have to go back in for sort of maintenance work. But my identity is not wrapped up in that. That is just part of my story. And it's getting patients to see that for them also. Their identity is not wrapped in whatever disorder is affecting them. That's just part of who they are. And it can be a small part or it can be a large part. It's really up to them. But getting them to see that there's so much more to who they are and the only limitations on their lives is the limitations that they place on themselves. Oh, I love it. Uh, and, and that's so, and, you know, especially shout out to the osteopath physicians where I think AT still talks about, you know, not defining your patients as, uh, oh, this is my diabetic patient. No, this is a patient with blank, right? And understanding that they are still a person and you're, because you're still a person, you know, you still have the issues going on here. You just happen to have whatever disorder you happen to have. So I, I definitely love, you know, the fact that you're able to kind of even, at, especially at that age, right? Because you, you said at 18, Right. And usually that's not an age where you're thinking that way. Right. You're usually thinking the other way where you're angry, you're, you're questioning, you're wondering why me. Like usually that's the normal mode because uh, I got some older adults who I still can't get them to break out of that mode. So, I, uh, you know, definitely commendable that, you know, you you were at least able to kind of mentally make that mind shift shift that said, you know what, this well, is a, this a is while, it. The process. Oh, me. yeah. You know, that, that, that is doing some hard work and realizing, wait a second, my life is not what I want it to be. And recognizing that the problem is not necessarily everybody else around me. It's in the way that I'm thinking about what's going on in my life or whatever my, my life circumstance has, happens to be in that moment. And, and as far as your institute, like, 
when when did that come about? Why did it come about? Like, because uh, again, it, it's again the concept is what's so interesting to me. Because again, you're you're I guess putting the brain first, right? Which is something you would think everyone would, but it it, it doesn't happen, unfortunately. Yeah. So the way that came about is actually pretty interesting. So I was maybe about two and a half, three years into being an epilepsy attending in private practice, and I had grown my practice. Six Part of the practice significantly large. So the practice is like a tri-state area practice, 20 epilepsy specialists, a couple of neurosurgeons and neuropsychologists. And I was really one of the more successful docs, probably in the top two, top three successful docs. The only one that was consistently more successful than me was the owner of the practice who started in the 1990s, right? And so didn't really care for the direction the practice was going and was kind of like, is this it for me? Like, is this what my life is going to look like? Like I was watching some of my older colleagues at the time and and seeing what they were doing and, and was like, I, I just can't see my life going in this direction. Something needs to change. So I actually resigned on the spot. No plan. Well, <laughs> I bet your brain was like, what are you doing? What are you doing? That's- yeah, my brain was first of all, like something needs to change. And then it was like, hold up, slow down. <laughs> you know, so the owner of the practice came to me and said, look, even if half your patients go with you, it's so many patients that it's going to kill our practice. And what he didn't know was I had no interest in at that point continuing to practice like a regular doctor does. But he said to me, what is it that you want? And so I said, well, I want the ability from a legal perspective to be able to open up my own neurology business. And so he said, fine. And he said, look, you do the epilepsy for us and we'll continue to pay full salary, pay your benefits. You can open up your own neurology business and we'll even refer you patients. Wow. And so I was like, all right, right. And I knew I didn't want your typical neurology practice where patients come to see you for 15 minutes, you up their meds and you send them on your way. So I created a program where we create individualized exercise regimens for patients based on their medical and neurological needs. One of my offices at the time was right next to a health spa. So I worked out a deal with the health spa where they, my patients could work out there underneath my direct and indirect supervision, and I would just program for them. That's how we got started. And since then, have, have been able to move it to online. And what have been some of those benefits? Because I'm pretty sure as a neurologist, people are kind of looking at you funny when you're saying, no, 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 I want to incorporate more than just the medications. I want to incorporate the mental, their physical. Like I want to incorporate all these things while also dealing with the neurological thing I'm dealing with. Like what was that initial reaction from your colleagues? Yeah, you know, I think a lot of people were skeptical and they were like, you know, what is he doing? You know, <laughs> he does so well in this this arena. Why would he take this kind of risk, but I was seeing the benefits in my in my patients, right? I mean, there were patients with refractory epilepsy, you know, seizing on three or four different meds, and you know, you get them to eat healthier and you get them to exercise on a regular basis, and their seizure frequency would go significantly down, right? I mean, I was able to take one person off their anti-epileptic medications and just control it with diet and exercise alone. Their anxiety and depression would significantly improve. Headaches would go away. And so I was doing the research, checking the literature. And with every neurological disease, exercise is really important. And exercise makes these diseases and disorders better. And I started to learn more and learn a lot more about neuroplasticity. Exercise is the biggest promoter of neuroplasticity there is. That is our brain's ability to adapt, to learn, and to heal. And so exercise should be at the foundation, I think, of any medical issue, right? I mean, when we think about the diseases that have gone up in the last 30 years, it is sedentary lifestyle, obesity, diabetes, and Alzheimer's disease. I mean, these are all lifestyle diseases. And what, what I love about that is, is and well, I think we, should, we definitely want, I want to kind of dive deep in because you even wrote a book, right? Again, much like community members, like, again, this isn't, uh, I promise you, this isn't your typical neurologist, right? This, this is one who, again, that's why I was kind of enamored. I was like, wow, okay, okay. I think we need to like have him on the show because not only did you do that, right? Where you started realizing I need to incorporate the whole person, right? I need to incorporate how much activity they're doing, what they're eating, when they're eating, when it's, I need to incorporate all of those things. If I'm going to adequately treat my patient, right? You said, you know what? I need to do that. Uh, and, and then you wrote a book about it, right? So, and then you kind of alluded to it, like th- talk a little bit about this neuroplasticity and the effects of exercise and everything else, right? And then let's talk about your book in general, right? Like what motivated you to write a book? Because I, I, I know most of us physicians, right? Like we, we got no problem writing journal stuff all day. And, and and I joke to my colleagues all the time. I say, you know, all those articles you write are great, but your patients aren't reading that. Right. You know, they're, they're not reading. 
I don't know. You know, it's very rare that I read an article in any journal where I'm like, oh, this article is about to save some lives, you know? And maybe I'm just a little jaded, but I, I just feel like it's rare that that happens. I think it's more for our intellectual curiosity than it is the actual application of some of these. Yeah, so, you know, we used to think that our brains, we were born with, with our brains and our brains never changed over our lifetimes. That if anything, that as we got older, maybe there'd be some age-related changes, some degeneration or some neurological disorder would take hold and that would have a negative impact on the brain or we'd have some trauma that would have negative impact on the brain. But now we know we know differently. We know that our brains are constantly evolving, that they are really dynamic. We know that our neurons are nerve cells that we're capable of making new neurons and nerve cells throughout our life. And that's really what neuroplasticity is about. It's about the things that have a negative and positive impact on the brain, the things that cause our brains to make new neurons, the things that cause our brains to lose neurons, cause the dysfunction of neurons. And a lot of those things are within our control. They are things that we do on a daily basis. And what are some things that we do that benefit that? And what are some things that we do that, you know, it may cause some problems? Yeah, so... <laughs> Exercise, you know, is certainly a huge benefit. Being sedentary, not being physically active, actually kills our brain cells. Wow. Okay. All right. That's uh, all right. Oftentimes when I go and, uh, you know, I'm giving talks, I'll give the story of a sea squirt, which a sea squirt, when it's born, it's a fully mobile tadpole. And it's got a, a full functioning nervous system, brain and spinal cord. And within the first 72 hours of its life, its primary goal is to find a place that it can park itself and never move again. And when it does that, its body releases chemicals that cause its brain and spinal cord to dissolve. And it's eventually left with like this rudimentary nerve cell as a brain. And we see the same things happen in people. When we stop moving, their brains start to shrink, start to atrophy. And so exercise is really important to combat that, right? I mean, I've seen 90-year-olds who are physically active, who eat well, who minimize stress. So those are a couple of things. Stress is a, a big one. Stress kills brain cells, especially in the part of the brain responsible for memory. And so people will often come to me and, and talk about how, you know, they're, they're increasingly forgetful. And when you talk about the things that are sort of going on in their life, they're under chronic stress. And we're all built to have to endure a short birth of stress. But chronic stress is not good for any aspect of our body and certainly our brains. It doesn't allow us to make new memories. And all that cortisol and adrenaline, and adrenaline is also killing neurons. That's another thing that's really important. Constantly learning. It doesn't matter how old we get, we need to be constantly learning. I've seen so many people who have had the same job for the last 50 years, right? And they could be physicians, they could be lawyers, they've been doing the same thing, they've done a great job in their field. Most people will tell you that they are brilliant, but they retire from what they were doing, and three months later, they are like completely demented, right? Because their brains never had a significant amount of reserve, they weren't actually learning new information. They just got really good at doing what they had always been doing. And once they stopped that, it was like they just fell off a cliff. And, you know, hey, what I love about this is because you're not mentioning like the the alcohol and drugs, because that's what people always think, right? Like, which we know those cause problems too. Follow uh, soon. All right. So, but the know. fact that you're like, no, being sedentary, not exercising, being yeah. super stressed, right? Yeah. Causes problems too. So I love that you're hitting home on those points because I think some of our listeners, listeners need to hear that, right? Because they need to hear like, no, no, no. Just because you think you avoid those couple of things don't mean that you're not in trouble. I mean, you need to avoid those things too. Those have a negative impact on the brain, alcohol and drugs. But yeah, it's other things that we do on a daily basis. I tell people all the time that we need to have different conversations with different people. If we always have the same conversation with people who think the way that we do, that's not good for brain health either. You know, that's not going to solve any issues in our life. We don't necessarily need to agree with everybody, but their perspective is invaluable. It gives us a different way of thinking. And because of that, that causes the formation of new neurons and new connections. So that's really important, you know, and, and one place where we see that not having conversations with people who think differently from us, the negative impact that that has, that's in our current political system, right? I mean, mm -hmm. that, that's, you know, for, that's literally that was the first thing I was like, oh, I bet, they, yeah, I bet folks who talk to Republicans, mm -hmm. they, get, they get, you know, they, you know, they sort of stand their ground in whatever their ideology is. They don't talk to each other. Therefore, there's no new solutions to any problems, right? Um, and so, talking to people who think differently from us is incredibly important, important as well. And and. 
talk about the book. What was your what, what was your initial thought process? Like, what was your goals when when, when you first out and say, you know, what? I'm going to write a book. I'm going to write a book, and like and because of this theory, but not really theory, this practice of action. Like, what was that? Like, especially as a physician, because I mean, I'm always intrigued at my physician colleagues who who kind of go out the box because I know what it takes to do that. Yeah. So for me, you know, the, the inspiration for the book was definitely the patients that I take care of, people that I, I serve in general. And when you think about neurological disorders and the devastating impact that it has on patients and their families. But I, I've spent the last, I don't know, maybe 10 years, 11 years uh, when you include my training, seeing how people with devastating neurological injuries have risen up, that they have fought for their life, they've fought for their independence. A lot of them have not let their diagnosis sort of define who they are. And so they were really the inspiration. It was, it was the patients that were doing the work every day to change their neurological destiny, you know, to change their life and to create their, their own life. And so, yeah, they inspired me to write this book. And it was about why the things that they do have the impact that, that it has. And for a person who, you know, is going to be picking up this book, what, what should they expect to get out the book? If in, in your mind, when you were writing it and you were finishing it, if you had to point to one goal from the book, what would you say that would be? Well, first of all, I would say this, that one of the things that I learned in writing a book is that a book is never actually finished, right? I mean, you there was actually supposed to be probably another good 10 different sections to this book. Um, but when you're talking about things that have to do with the brain, for a lot of people, that's scary and that can be complicated, right? And so you don't want this massive book that people are going to be like, oh my God, I, I can't read that. And so a book is never really finished. It's just when you decide, okay, this is it for this part and I'm going to put this part out first. Or if a publisher comes to you because we want these to buy a certain date or, or whatever the case is. But the thing that I want people to really take away is I, I want people to have a completely different relationship with their, their brain than they've had before. I think for a lot of people, they don't give their brains much thought until something goes wrong. Right? And our brains are like, are like our muscles. If you want it to grow and evolve, you have to stimulate it. You've got to do so in different ways. You've got to take care uh, of your brain. And my sort of tagline for my company, it's on all our t-shirts, so it's actually on this t-shirt and our wristband. It says one brain, one body. Everything that you do your body, the way that you treat your body impacts your brain and everything about your brain impacts your body. And people don't necessarily realize that that is the case. And a lot of physicians don't realize it either. You know, So I'll get called, called to see somebody who's had, whether it's high blood pressure, diabetes, or some inflammatory disorder for years, and they'll be like, oh, they're having some issues with their brain. And it's like, yeah, because this high blood pressure, diabetes, or inflammation not only impacts their body, it has a significant impact on their brain and it's been damaging their brain this entire time. So uh, the segue, uh, when we talk about brain health and uh, I'm a, such a big fan of physicians who go a different direction. You have your institute where you focus on the overall well-being of health. You have your book where you actually wrote a book because most physicians don't write books unless they're writing it for boring conferences that none of our patients actually go to. But then you went the next step and say, you know what, I'm going to create an app as well. Tell us the motivation behind that app. And ladies and gentlemen, the app is absolutely amazing. It's on iOS. It's on the, the Android platform. Please download it. it. Of course, the links will be in the show notes for you to kind of get that. Give it to your kids as well, too, right? This isn't just an adult app. Kids can kids can play this app, too, and have just as much of a great time. So uh, talk to us about the app. Yes. So actually, so the book is called Neuroplasticity, Your Brain Superpower. The app is called Dr. Dion's Brain Fit. And believe it or not, actually, I don't play games. <laughs> But I wanted a really fun way to teach people about how food and, and exercise and other lifestyle choices impact their brain. And I thought a game would be a really great way to do that, especially because everywhere you look, people are on their phones doing something, right? They're, they're on the bus, they're on the train, they get a minute of free time, they're on their phones. And so I wanted to kind of meet people where they were at. I wanted to find a really fun way to, to teach them, to influence their health and just get them to live sort of healthier lives. And we've, I've used this app as a learning tool where I'm teaching um, students, so kids, like elementary school kids, high school kids, and even full-fledged adults when I'm, when I'm talking to them. And everybody seems to really enjoy it. And 
what, what has been some of the uh, the results? Is this something you kind of incorporate as an overall process from a treatment plan with some of your patients? Is this something where you say, you know what, no, I think you would definitely be much more apt to kind of going this route and using the app and kind of using that I guess, quote unquote, part of the brain to learn and, you know, to build up your brain. And, you know, again, we got to, it's like we exercise and we build up muscle to when we're gaining weights, you know, building up the brain is just as important. Yeah. So, you know, I think games serve different functions and I think games are very much like books, right? You have different genres of games. And so this game, this app is definitely a, a, a puzzle game. It's a matching game. Uh, so you get to match healthy foods and healthy activities. And as you match, and as you go through the levels, there are questions that come up related to that particular level, that particular disease state. So people are learning about that disease and how exercise and food impacts those diseases. So, you know, it, it's not necessarily, I don't make any claims like, oh, this is going to improve your cognition. It's going to improve your memory or, or anything. I prefer to think of this like, you know, when patients come to us and maybe you give them material to take home or, or even better than that, patients come to us and we're educating them in the office, right? But we are educating them about their diseases or their medications during a very stressful period where they are stressed out about what they are going through and how this is going to impact their life. Oftentimes, a lot of physicians will use a lot of medical jargon and, and people in general don't understand healthcare the way that they should. They're sort of healthcare illiterate and by no fault of their own, the system is sort of designed that way. So I think with the game, you meet people where they're, they're at and you allow them to, when they go home on their own time, on their own terms, they're able to go back and access information that's going to affect a potential disease that they may encounter. Right? And so the levels to this game include sedentary lifestyle, it includes hypertension and diabetes, and works its way up to things that we think of as primary neurological diseases like stroke, multiple sclerosis. And the last level, level 40, is Alzheimer's disease. And the entire time, they can just go and learn about how different foods and exercise and stress has an impact on all of this. Absolutely love it. I absolutely love it. So before I let you go, one of these, I, I like to call this my my promotional period, right? Because we highlight so many different physicians like yourself who are doing so many amazing things like yourself. I want to make sure that I, I allow that time to say like, hey, what are you doing? Like, how can people get in contact with you? What is like, how can they kind of get into your world? Right. So let us know. Is there any more books? Right. There's any more courses there any, like what's going on and how can someone kind of be in touch and intertwined with you? Right. So said, so this book that just came out in April is Neuroplasticity, Your Brain's Superpower. The, the game, Dr. Dion's Brain Fit, that actually came out in November. I'm currently co-authoring another book now about perception with actually a, a psychiatrist. So it's written from the perspective of a neurologist and a psychiatrist. And it's about how, really about how we perceive the world around us and what influences our perception. I am working on creating an online learning platform um, for people when it, so they can learn about their health and all the different things that impact their health. And so, yeah, so we've got a couple of, couple of big things in the works. And, and the Inley Brain Fit Institute, what we do is we create individualized exercise programs for people based on their medical and neurological needs. And so continuing to grow that. Uh, so, so people have all of those things to look forward to. Perfect. I absolutely love that. And a uh, question I always, my last question I always ask my guests before they get out of here is, and you kind of, obviously you kind of, you know, hit home, you know, a lot of the points throughout, but like, how is what you're doing helping to empower others to take better control of their health? Yeah. So I think our, our current healthcare system is, is a very passive one, right? I mean, people come to see us, it's like, all right, take this pill. They don't, they don't really have to do anything, but take a pill. And we know that at best, it's a band-aid approach. It's not, it's not really curing the underlying disease process. Or it's like, let's take them to the OR. But it's not anything that they're actively doing themselves. And I think when you get people to move their bodies, when you get them to exercise, when you teach them about food, when you teach them how to minimize their stress, because they're learning, because they're actively doing, then you're truly empowering them. And I think when people are empowered, they can reach their absolute potential. They certainly can reach their neurological potential. They get a lot more creative. They sort of take uh, their lives by the horns. And so I think we're really teaching people just how truly powerful they actually are. Right? I mean, I get to see the brains of people from all around the world, all religions, 
all cultural background, everybody's brain looks the exact same way. And I think what that speaks to is that we are all capable of doing really, really great things. All we need to do is remove the limit, the limitations that we put on ourselves and that society tries to put on us also. And once we do that, I think, yeah, we're, we're, we're capable of, of being truly great in every way. Absolutely love it. Absolutely love that answer. Phenomenal. How can others get in contact with you? What, what what are your websites? What are your links? What are your socials? Like what, what's 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 going on? How did, how can they reach out to you? Follow you and kind of kind of go through your, your mission with you. They can reach out to me through email. So Philippe Dion at gmail dot com. P h i l i p p e d o u y o n at gmail dot com. They can reach out to me through my website www dot institute dot com. So i n l e BrainFit, B-R-A-I-N-F-I-T, institute.com, all one word. They can find me on Instagram, so they can look me up. Just look up my name, Philippe Dion, and they'll find me on Instagram. At Twitter, it's at Philippe Dion. And they can also find me on LinkedIn and Facebook. Love it. And again, remember, uh, listeners, all of these links will be in the show notes, so you won't have to go far. He's definitely, again, I know you guys thought, oh, what is a neurologist going to tell me about my health? And clearly, there's a lot. Right. So and I, and I absolutely love that aspect of it. Right. That even down to the neurological fiber, if you don't take care of yourself and especially from an active approach, if you aren't actively doing something, problems can and will arise and are arising because we aren't doing it. So, you know, Leo, thank you for really helping the Lunch Learn community members kind of turn another chapter in their their pursuit of learning. And, uh, and helping them understand that from a neurological standpoint, we still got a lot of work to do, but we can do it. Absolutely. You know, and the power to change our lives is certainly within ourselves. It's within the way that we think. And our, our brains are capable of a tremendous amount of greatness and creation. So we've got to make sure we take good care of our brains. Thank you for getting to the end of the show. I am your host, Dr. Barry Pierre, host of The Lunch Learner, Dr. Barry. And this is another amazing episode that we like to bring to you week after week on betterment of empowering yourself for better health today if you have not had a chance please go ahead and subscribe to the show if this is your first time listening if you already listen and you've already subscribed make sure to leave me a five-star review because your support is absolutely important in keeping the show moving as it is and if you have not had a chance and you want to check out today's show notes always head over to lunchlearnpod.com that is lunch learn pod all in one word dot com and you can get the access to my show notes for every single episode but separately especially the one you just listened to and i'm gonna see you guys next week you guys be blessed bye